Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Ann Patchett is the author of nine novels, including Bel Canto, State of Wonder, Commonwealth, and The Dutch House, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Her latest, Tom Lake, is a meditation on youthful love, married love, and the lives parents have led before their children were born. At the beginning of the pandemic, Laura's three daughters returned to the family's orchard in northern Michigan. While picking cherries, they begged their mother to tell them the story of Peter Duke, a famous actor with whom she shared both a stage and a romance years before at a theater company called Tom Lake. As Laura recalls the past, her daughters examined their own lives and relationship with their mother and are forced to reconsider the world and everything they thought they knew. It is a magnificent new novel. It is Tom Lake, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Ann Patchett to this week's book show. Thank you so much for being with us. What a delight to have you. Thanks for having me. I I love this book so much, and it's just so joyful and beautiful and fun. And I, I'm curious as to at at what point you were in where you said, "Oh, I could I could make this. I can do this kind of book." A joyful, fun book? Yes. So, you know what's really odd? I thought, oh my gosh, I really want to write something joyful and fun. And finally, I've done it. And by the time I got to the end and got some distance from it, it actually is also a sad book in a lot of ways, uh, which I think I didn't realize so much when I was writing it, but both things are really true. How do you feel, without giving things away, obviously, how do you feel it is sad in the sense of the characters are living through the pandemic, uh, the current day characters? There are many flashbacks that bring us back to Laura's life and her growing up and and her maturing uh, into adulthood. So what aspect of of it did you find to to be sad? I think the whole global warming aspect of it. <laughs> well, yes. Which is the, the thing that really makes me saddest. But the daughters thinking about their futures on the cherry farm. And a lot of the book is about when Laura was 24. What she worried about was, am I going to get the part? Am I going to get the guy? Are we going to have fun? Am I going to get to keep the guy? And then her daughters, who are 22, 24, and 26, and they want to hear about her life. But what they're worrying about is the pandemic and global warming and what's going to happen to their futures, not their personal futures, but really the futures of the world. So uh, it's, it's a lot about, I think, how much harder young people have it today than people like me, you know, when I was that age. I guess the aspect of of the fun part of it is that you have three daughters who seem to be having a great deal of fun. It's not always fun, but mostly sort of ribbing their mother and to have her tell this story that there's aspects they've heard before, but boy, there's a lot they want to know. Yes. And there's also the vast majority of it that they think that they know and they got wrong. And that is a lot of the fun of the novel, that the daughters are always correcting their mother about aspects of her life. They're saying, no, no, that's not the way it happened. But, you know, they maybe half listened or she half told them something when they were kids, and then they just filled in the rest any way they want to. And they believe that they are so much smarter and and more well-informed than their parents that they're always getting tripped up. Joe, who is the the father, going back to our earlier discussion, is is the one who's sort of keeping the eyes on the prize is, is the orchard and what's going to happen to it. And yet all this other conversation is taking place. Right. Joe, Joe is a is a great guy and loves his family and loves his farm and is trying his best to do a good job and stay in denial about what's going on. You know, there's a there's just an extraordinary microclimate in northern Michigan in the fruit belt that allows all of these cherries and apples and plums and everything to grow so perfectly. And that climate is changing. And 
Joe is not dealing with it in the same way that young Benny, who is the fiance of the oldest daughter, Emily, and Benny and Emily are both farmers. And Benny is saying the future is in asparagus. The future is in strawberries. It's not going to be in stone fruit anymore. What brought you, what brought your characters to this part of the country and specifically to Tom Lake? So years ago, when I published Bel Canto, which was in 2001, my publicist sent me to a place called Petoskey, Michigan. And to get to Petoskey, Michigan, you've got to fly to Detroit, take a commuter plane to Traverse City, and then drive two hours to go to this tiny bookstore, McLean and Eakin, in this tiny town. And then I did it all in one day. I had to be someplace the next day. So I did my event, drove two hours back to Traverse City, flew back to Detroit, and then went on to wherever I was going. And I was not happy about it. However, it turns out that McLean and Eakin became my favorite bookstore in the country. And the Norcross family who had started that bookstore became great friends of mine. And I started going to Petoskey to vacation. Um, I just loved it up there. I later made some very close friends in Traverse City, one of whom, Aaron Whiting, had grown up on a cherry farm and then later started a professional theater company. And I thought, oh, I if I want to write about farming and theater and our town, I need to set it in Michigan because I have such fabulous resources there. And Patchett is our guest. The name of the new novel is Tom Lake. It is published by Harper. You just mentioned what my next question was going to be, which is Our Town. I was brought up to, well, I loved Our Town, but I was brought up to greatly appreciate Our Town. <laughs> my mother was, was uh, it was her favorite play. And you you really grasp it at the very uh, beginning of the, of the novel and, and don't let it go. At the end, you say, I thank Thornton Wilder, who wrote the play that has been an, an enduring comfort, guide, and inspiration throughout my life. How, how so? I read Our Town, I don't know, you know, when I was 14 or 15, whenever kids read Our Town in high school. And it just meant the world to me. But it is the, the one piece of literature I return to the most often. I feel certain that a year hasn't gone by that I haven't read Our Town throughout the course of my life. And it's meant very different things to me as I've gotten older. It's funny, I see it now almost as a Buddhist text. It really is about how nothing happens and in that quiet nothing is the complexity of the universe, all of life, everything that we're ever going to see. And the, and the question, the only question is, can we keep our eyes open to life? Can we be aware of it while it's happening and appreciate it? And so when I decided to write this book about somebody who played Emily in our town, it then became a story of how our town really informs her whole life. It informs her life because she plays Emily and then plays Emily again. She has a daughter that she names Emily. It's very much a part of her life. Was was acting ever something, was that on your radar at all? No, I uh, I never acted. I never grew cherries and I never had kids. I just make stuff up. I, I'll tell you what, though, if I was young, and I could go back and redo my education, I would take nothing but acting classes because I feel like acting for a novelist and a novelist who goes on really long book tours would have been a very handy skill for me to have. To, to have that, that skill of working with an audience and to, and to tell stories, I assume, right. about I mean, your stories. And I'm good at it. I, I certainly yeah. find myself up on stage many, many nights. But it's it's not only how we communicate if you're up on a stage or, frankly, if you're just communicating in your day, you constantly readjust your story for your audience. And that is also a lot of what this book is about. I'm going to tell this story one way to my daughters, one way to my husband, one way to my former boyfriend. We shape our characters. 
But when you're writing, it also would be very handy to know more about acting because writing is an exercise in character development. When you talk about character development, tell us about Peter Duke and how that character developed over time. I have a great friend named Katrina Kennison who lives in Peterborough, New Hampshire, which is where our town was written. And when I was on tour for the Dutch house, I was staying with her one night and we were taking a hike in the morning. She said, what are you going to write next? And I had just this very vague idea. I said, I really want to write a book about a woman who played Emily in our town and how it affects her life. And Katrina said, oh my God, I wanted to play Emily more than anything. I was cast as Rebecca. Rebecca is George Gibbs's little sister in our town. And she said, I fell in love with the boy who played George. So she fell in love with her brother in the play. And she said he was so handsome and talented and wild. And he had a guitar and a car. And as soon as she started saying this, I was like, oh man, this is the story. It's the story about how you fall in love in this crazy way over the summer, how you fall in love while you were in a play. And while I haven't been to summer stock theaters, I have been to a lot of artist colonies in my life. And it's the same thing. It's like a bunch of grownups go to summer camp. You get into enormous trouble on day one. And and that would have been before COVID. And yet, the pandemic is very much a part of of this book so that it almost lent itself to bring all of those characters together in a closed environment. I have to say, when I started putting this book together before COVID, I just, it was not a problem. Three, three daughters come home, farm girls come home for the summer to work on the farm while they're still in school. That's what mm. you do. I mean, I grew up in rural Tennessee. I I, I know enough to know that. So they were always going to come home anyway, just because that's that's how they made their money for the for the school year. But then I thought, oh, OK, here's COVID. So, yes, they come home. They come home earlier. They have to come home and they're stuck. And if there's any element I love in a novel, it's that the people are trapped and they have to stay put and they have to work out their problems. And the problems that they're working out are are sometimes very much on the page and sometimes worked out behind the scenes. And that's fascinating because we sort of come back to them where the problem has been worked out. And now here we are and here they are looking at the next step. And that's that's the way you have to write a novel. You you absolutely <laughs> cannot put everything in there. The, the sort of cliched novel advice is show, don't tell. Maybe if you're writing War and Peace, which I have to say, my computer is on a giant hardback copy of War and Peace right now. <laughs> so you, you can you can just show everything. But in a novel, you have to compress things. And so you don't want to have 30 pages necessarily of Emily and Benny talking about the farm and, and their future and what they're going to do. You just have one page where the younger sister says, oh, I was with Emily and Benny last night playing Pictionary, and this is the news that was revealed to me. Do you guys know this? Uh, you have to figure out a way to use economy. Ann Patchett is our guest on this week's book show. The new novel is Tom Lake, and it is published by Harper. I want to talk about Laura, but I, I, I'm fascinated because this is a character who we mentioned played Emily in Our Town and then has an opportunity, maybe, 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 to go to Broadway to play opposite Spalding Gray. I, I, I saw that version. Oh, with did Spalding you? Gray. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Why are we talking about anything else? I'm in a fangirl so hard. Tell me about it. Well, it was amazing. He's amazing. But I was I was wondering if you had seen it because I uh, my as I said, my mother was very much into uh, our town and any production we ever that was ever a large production we would go see. And we we saw Paul Newman in that. We saw James Whitmore in it. We saw. Why did not I know you <laughs> while I was writing this book? You would have been my number one resource. This is crushing. 
Well, you've seen, I assume you've seen the, the monologue that he does where he, he has a whole thing on there where, where he has to address the audience and he says, you know what I mean? And he goes over and over and over again of dissecting that. I don't know if you've ever seen that part that he's uh, of that monologue that he did. Um, but it's fascinating because it was a very different stage manager and uh, and you sort of play with that, too, in the stage managers that that Laura works with. OK, I'm sorry. I know you're throwing me a question, but I'm just not going to take it. I'm going to knock it right back to you. <laughs> who was the best? Who was the best stage manager you ever saw? I would say that probably Paul Newman was the best that I've ever seen. But that may be clouded by the fact that my mother was an absolute like became a fangirl when she saw Paul Newman on the stage and we were four rows from him. So that was like an amazing, and that was also an amazing production, Jane Atkinson, Jane Curtin, I'm leaving people out, uh, but uh, an amazing production of, of Our Town. That was very, very special. But but aren't they, I th you know, it's it's a great play. They're all quite special. Somebody was telling me about a really iconic Our Town that was off Broadway, where they cooked bacon in the oh, end. Oh no, I don't. I don't know about the bacon episode. That when Emily goes back after she dies, and she goes back to see her mother on her her birthday, and the mother is cooking bacon, and the smell of bacon fills the whole theater, and people just start sobbing. Wow, I guess that was David Cromer that did that. I know I missed that one. You play with that with uh, there is this washed up, we'll say, sitcom actor, somewhat washed up, who plays the stage manager in the production that Laura is in. And it just makes sense because it's somebody that people know and will sell tickets. Right. And, you know, she has she's seen so many bad stage managers. She's seen people who've been bad in every aspect of the play. And this guy, um, Albert Long, who everybody calls Uncle Wallace because that was his famous role on television, is in fact an incredibly tender and moving stage manager. So other people, Peter Duke uh, makes fun of him because he is so washed up, but even washed up, he does a wonderful job, which I think is a great thing about the role of the stage manager. You can't age out of it. Whereas Laura is so aware of the fact that she's not going to be able to play Emily much longer. And and understands that, but is sort of fascinated by by that fact, right? That that there is kind of an expiration date on it. She's fascinated, but she's really scared because her revelation through playing Emily, this at Tom Lake, this is the third time she's been cast in the role. Mm is that it's the only thing she's good at. You know, that she's also cast as May in Fool for Love and she's terrible at it. And one of the things I thought a lot about when I was writing is I can sing like three songs really well. I mean, if I sang the right song, you'd be like, wow, she can really sing. But I can't sing because my range is about an inch and a half wide. And I think that Laura is a very similar thing. Laura identifies very strongly with Emily. She understands that's how she got into acting. Everything else she has ever done in acting is really just an extension of Emily, but she can't play anything else. And she understands that about herself, but other people don't believe it. They don't understand it about her. I assume you couldn't, just by the subject matter, you couldn't get away from Chekhov either. <laughs> you know, this is a great story. Uh, so, Tom Hanks recorded the audiobook for The Dutch House. And Meryl Streep recorded the audiobook for Tom oh, Lake. And it so is good. extraordinary. So good. Um, but when I was in the middle of writing Tom Lake, I had lunch with Tom and his wife, Rita Wilson. They were in town and they were asking me about the book I was working on. And I said, you know, this and this. And it takes place in a cherry orchard. And he said, what, are you going to tell me they're three daughters? And I said, yes, three sisters on a cherry orchard. So there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of subtle theater humor in the book. And that 
is something that obviously we as as readers and and certainly people who who love reading plays uh, greatly enjoy but i assume that you like playing with as well yes absolutely and i am a great reader of plays but i am not uh, an attender of theater in large part because i live in nashville and when i go to new york and i have a free night i go to the opera so I almost never get to the theater. I would think that you would would have a love of the craft of, of playwriting and, and be fascinated by how a play is crafted. I absolutely am. I just feel, I don't know. I don't know if it's cheating or if it's terrific to be somebody who reads plays. I have stacks of them by my desk, but I signed up for the, the drama services where you get a, a box yes. of plays. It's been so good for me because it has made me read plays I n certainly never would have seen, but also just things I never would have heard of. I'm uh, reading your book and then I'm listening to your book and uh, Meryl Streep is doing this amazing job. Uh, what was it that got Meryl Streep interested in wanting to do this? So I met Meryl Streep 15 years ago. There was a period of about 10 minutes when she was interested in playing Roxanne Koss in the movie of Bel Canto. And it did not work out, but we met. And I knew she would remember that meeting um, because there was a lot of drama around it. And my agent is Felicity Blunt. Felicity Blunt is the sister of Emily Blunt and Felicity Blunt is married to Stanley Tucci. And so I knew that Felicity and Stanley must know Meryl, of course, because Stanley and Meryl have been in several movies together. So I emailed Felicity and said, I really want to ask Meryl about the, you know, off chance that she might record the book. I always heard her voice in my head and thought about her three girls. And Felicity gave me Meryl's email. I wrote to her and said, this is what the book is about. Is there any chance that you might consider doing the audiobook? And she wrote back and she said, oh, that sounds great. Sure. You're so, you're so kind to have considered me. I would love to do this. And I said, don't you want to read the book first? And she was like, no, 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 you're great. It's great. It sounds terrific. I'll do it. And she did. And it's wonderful. And, and it's hard. There are moments where, as she is telling the story, that you think she's telling her story because there's there's the actress, there's the there's the children. And, and it's it's it all is lovely when it comes together like that. Yeah, there's a there's a moment in the story when I wrote the novel. Uh, Meryl Streep was the actress who presented the Best Actor Award to Peter Duke at the Academy Awards. <laughs> and when she agreed to do it, I before you know she had read the book or we'd gone to work, I said, this is in there. Um, and, and I think that's great, but if it would make you uncomfortable or it would feel too self-referential, you pick the actress that you would rather have. And she wrote back and said, yes, change it to Viola Davis. And so I did. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Very, very cool. Do you think uh, as you as you look forward as to what is next and and how far are you on on that or are you in no hurry? Um, I am. Boy, am I in no hurry. And. I own a bookstore in Nashville, Parnassus, Parnassus and yes. there is a whole other layer of work and publication if you own a bookstore. I signed personalizations that came off of internet orders for nine hours yesterday, and I will do it again tonight. So I'm, I haven't- One started. of them may be mine. <laughs> I hope uh, so. I, yeah, no, I have one. I have one in. I don't know if you've done it or not. I, and I and I said the, the note said, "Do you want it personalized?" I said yes to Joe. And if she liked the interview, have her tell me that. And if she didn't like the interview, well, she can say that too. <laughs> okay, I have I have done thousands of these so far. 
I don't remember that. Well, it, it may be coming. Yeah, it may, it may still be coming. So uh, the amount of work that I have to do before I even get out the door to start doing work, I, I don't know. I've got like a three celled idea for the future, but I don't know what will happen. I have many, many friends who are independent booksellers. We, of course, with this show and in and, and my work, we do a lot of uh, interacting with independent bookstores. Uh, as, as someone who is the owner of an independent bookstore, when I talk to my friends, they, they, see hope, they seem hopefully optimistic. They seem like they're, I mean, they're concerned about sort of the greater, uh, obviously greater issues about censorship and about books that are available to people. And they're doing wonderful work on the ground in that, uh, in that uh, realm and doing wonderful work in communities. But, but as an owner, how do, you, how do you feel about how independent bookstores are faring these days? You know, we're speaking for Parnassus, we're doing great. And I, and by doing great, what does doing great mean? Right. It means that we are able to pay our employees, you know, a decent wage. Everybody has health insurance and a 401k. That's, that is my definition of doing great. Um, and I know so many novelists who say, oh, you know, reading's dead, nobody cares. It's a great thing to own a bookstore because people come in every day because they want a novel, they want the new nonfiction, they're excited, they want suggestions. Book selling when you are in the bookstore feels pretty darn vibrant and hopeful. Nobody is going to get rich owning a little independent bookstore, uh, but I don't think anybody goes into it for that. The new novel is absolutely gorgeous. It is Tom Lake. It is published by Harper. Ann Patchett, what a delight to speak to you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Ann Patchett's new novel is Tom Lake. It is published by Harper. Thanks to our producer, Sarah LaDuke. Write to us at book at wamc.org. The latest on national productions programs, available via the Airwaves newsletter at WAMC.org and on social media at WAMC Radio. Bookmark us for next week.